three people are missing after a Pakanjikum house fire. Deputy Police Chief Ryan Hughes will be back on the job. And marking the one-year anniversary of the war in Ukraine. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Three people are feared dead in the aftermath of a serious house fire in Pakanjikum First Nation. OPP say the blaze had engulfed the house by the time police arrived on the scene Wednesday evening. Eyewitnesses say a neighboring home was also destroyed. Several people in that home escaped safely. But OPP say three people in the home where the fire started are unaccounted for. A joint investigation is underway between the Ontario Fire Marshal, the Pakanjikum Police Service and the OPP's Criminal Investigation Branch and the Forensic Identification Unit. Donations are being collected by Pakanjikum Deputy Chief Jonas Strang to support a teenage girl who survived the fire. Well, here in this city, two seniors have been saved thanks to the quick response from Thunder Bay Fire Rescue. Just after one o'clock this morning, firefighters responded to an emergency, an emergency on Markland Street. A resident and her husband were trapped on the second floor of their home by a fire on the ground level. Fire crews entered and carried the pair to safety. The victims were transported to hospital. The suspension of Deputy Police Chief Ryan Hughes is being rescinded, and he'll be returning to duty on Monday. The reinstatement comes after an external police investigation was recently completed and handed over to the Thunder Bay Police Board. Hughes was suspended with pay in January of 2022 after a human resources complaint was filed against him. The external probe found that all but two of the allegations against Hughes were unsubstantiated. The two claims that were substantiated related to improper disclosure of confidential police information to senior officers and a deputy chief from another police service. Corrective action has been taken, which the board says was accepted by Hughes. Today's media release states that Hughes is pleased to return to active service next week week with a return to work plan to help with the reintegration. No one from the police board was available for comment. Almost 6,000 local health care workers will soon undergo mandatory training to help make their organizations more inclusive. It's part of Wake the Giants new Indigenous cultural and inclusivity training, which is the result of two years of preparation and consultation. Vasilios Bellows explains. It's a big step towards equal health care for all in Thunder Bay. Both the Regional Hospital and St. Joseph's Care Group have announced their employees will be taking part in a new virtual Indigenous culture and training program. The training was created by officials with Wake the Giant and developed by the Northern Anishinaabe Education Council. Around 5,900 employees and volunteer workers in the city will learn how to identify systemic racism in the healthcare sector while learning more about Indigenous culture, history and traditions. Providing them with the background of, you know, what it really feels like when, um, you know, people don't understand where we come from or who we are and, you know, being given that opportunity to take the time you need to share with people is, um, you know, such an important part of developing something that is going to educate people on who we are as Indigenous people. Many from Indigenous communities across the region come to the Regional Hospital for Care, meaning their first impression of the city is in the healthcare sector. Hospital President Rhonda Crocker Ellicott says that's one reason why she wanted this training for staff, with many employees already seeking these opportunities. Our staff believe very strongly that this cultural safety training is really important and have been asking for something like this that could be across the entire organization, not just for a few people, for everybody coming to the same place. And for us to be able to create an environment where people feel safe, that's our, that's our priority. Over at St. Joseph's Care Group, President Kelly O'Brien explains what this will mean for her organization. I'm making mandatory training for 2,200 of our staff to complete the online module. But more importantly for us, it's part of our process as we walk with humility to create a culture where everyone feels welcome and, uh, and with respect and dignity receive their care with respect and dignity. It's expected that all health care employees and volunteers will complete the virtual training by March of 2025. Vasilios Bellows, TBT News. 
For the second day in a row, local unionized healthcare workers protested against the Ford government. Yesterday, it was led by nurses with the ONA, and today, Unifor organized a rally outside St. Joseph's Hospital, calling for a halt to the privatization of healthcare. The picket line was attended by five unions that represent local healthcare workers. Mike Lang reports. I say worker, you say power! The pressure continues to increase on the PC government to change their approach to health care. For the second day in a row, close to 100 union members and supporters, this time led by Unifor, gathered to rally against Premier Doug Ford and call for greater access to public health care. We uh, as health care workers are, uh, firmly stand against the privatization of our health care system. I think, you know, almost all Canadians do. Uh, nobody uh, elected him on a mandate to privatize our health care system. The Conservative Party and any other uh, uh, political party needs to understand that this is, a, this is a human right, this is our right, this is what we pay for and we want it to be kept public. If we all stand together and, and fight uh, for a, a better public health care system, we can win that fight and, and keep our, our hospitals public. Unifor represents over 4,500 registered nurses, nurse practitioners, physiotherapists, and other healthcare workers in northwestern Ontario. The rally was also attended by supporters of the Ontario Health Coalition, SEIU, ONA, and OPSU, and local NDP member Lise Vaujois. They are, in fact, setting things up so that private, large, multinational corporations can come in here and make money off of people when they are most vulnerable. Shame. It's criminal. Local PC member Kevin Holland acknowledged the protests and says he has discussed their concerns with local officials. I've taken the advice and the comments that they've provided to me back down to Queen's Park, provided it to the Health Minister and Minister of Labour, to help develop the plans that we feel we're going to need in the region to, to address the challenges we're facing. Unifor's contract with the government has been expired since October 2021 and their renegotiation process remains ongoing. But with all these union protests, their message is clear. They want better access to health care and better care for those providing it. Mike Lang, TVT News. Well, the province says it's made major strides in bringing on new inspectors to oversee long-term care homes across Ontario. These additional inspectors will help strengthen what is already Canada's toughest inspection and enforcement regime. Ontario now leads all provinces with the highest inspector-to-home ratio in the country, surpassing our goal of having one inspector for every two homes in the province. Paul Calandra says 193 staff members have been hired, including 156 new inspectors. He says the new hires will both finish on or complete on-site inspections and respond to complaints more quickly. The OPP have charged an Ignace man with possession of child pornography. 53-year-old Herbert Price, better known as Norm Price, was arrested yesterday and electronic devices were seized. Police are encouraging parents to speak with their children about internet safety and to consult protectchildren.ca for more information on how to do that. Today marks exactly one year since Ukraine was invaded by Russia, sparking the war that continues today. Local residents held a rally at City Hall soon afterwards to show their support for Ukraine and denounce the Russian invasion. Since then, about 100 Ukrainian refugees have come to Thunder Bay. The federal government and individual Canadians, including many here in this city, have been working to help the embattled country. Walter Werwoda, the local branch president for the League of Ukrainian Canadians, says the need for support continues. There's uh, hope and there's, uh, there's been a lot of um, disgust, I suppose, is for lack of a better word. It's been a year of resistance and resilience by the Ukrainian people and we're hopeful that uh, this will be the only year that we'll have to recognize this uh, type of anniversary and hopefully the, uh, the invasion will come to an end of properly. Where Woda says the only way the conflict will end is if Russian troops leave Ukraine, either on their own or by force. We'll have more on the one year anniversary of the war later on in the news hour. The Thunder Bay Fire Rescue airboat had to be deployed yesterday evening to save someone walking out on the ice of the Cam River. Firefighters say the person who was inappropriately dressed for the conditions was intent on avoiding the rescuers and tried to run toward Mission Island. 
But the person was successfully boarded onto the boat and returned to shore where they were treated by paramedics for exposure. Firefighters are reminding people to stay off the ice. Grades 7 and 8 French immersion students from across the Lakehead School Board gathered at a call ground Morgan today to celebrate Francophone heritage and the Carnival de Belle. The event gave kids from the four schools the chance to meet and connect while learning the importance of French-Canadian culture. The Carnival de Ivel kicked off with many outdoor activities like an obstacle course, hockey, cornhole and an adapted version of curling. And I think it's safe to say what the fan favorite was. We just did tug of war and that was pretty fun. Yeah, the tug of war, the soccer was really fun. Yeah, I liked the tug of war. Tug of war, that's fun, yeah. And what was yours? Probably tug of war or else the soccer game. For many of the students, it was a chance to reconnect with old friends and make new ones while diving deeper into French-Canadian heritage. I think it's great that we're doing in-person uh, uh, activities. Uh, there's certainly sell, uh, uh, builds a sense of community. It's really cool because knowing that all the others are going to go to Hammershold with us too for high school, it's really good to meet other people. Yeah, it's nice to see everyone again. It's just cool to see. Like I haven't seen some of these kids in forever, and they all so much taller than me now. It's weird. <laughs> uh, it's like it's creating a sense of belonging in this school. Like we're learning all about, it and they're like French Canadian students and teachers at this school. So it's like it's like bringing us all together. After the fun was done outside, the kids moved inside to warm up and eat some of the French Canadian meals that the Great Eights helped prepare with some Ground Morgan alumni who are now at Hammershold. The cafeteria was filled with music provided by the Cam Valley Fiddlers. And it wouldn't be a complete Cannibal de Ivel without an appearance from the famous Bonhomme mascot. The Regional Health Sciences Foundation has found its next big 50-50 winner. Thunder Bay's Tara Gusola got the call today, notifying her that she'd won more than $700,000. Did you buy any tickets in the Thunder Bay 50-50 for the month of February? Oh my god, I'm going to die. No way. I bought them the day after the other draw, I think. I buy them every month. So, since I'm calling you, you might have won something today. Do you know what you've won? Oh no, is this seriously, is this the big amount? Is this the, like, the, the... <laughs> you, you have won $702,310 in February's Thunder Bay 5050. Oh my gosh, I'm seriously gonna faint. It's, it's a group ticket with me and my husband and my kids. Oh my god, I can't even look <laughs> She says the big win comes at a great time, with one daughter in university and another moving to Toronto. She also recently purchased a new car. Tickets are on sale now for next month's draw on March 31st. I'll never get, hired, get tired of hearing oh, those phone calls and those uh, excited winners. One of these months. We're going to get the gonna, call. It's going to be me. <laughs> yeah. Well, turning to weather now, Fiona, it was uh, another one that was chillier than we'd like to see. We had a cool start to the day. Uh, we started out at about uh, 8 a.m. with a low of minus 26 and a wind chill of minus 32. Now, all I can say is that's going to make uh, the next few days all that sweeter because uh, we did warm up over yesterday's high. Uh, we topped out at minus 10 and a wind chill of minus 14. That's with loads of sunshine and winds, for the most part, relatively light from the west, 7 to 18 kilometers per hour. Now, uh, to the west, we've got uh, a lot of clear skies. In fact, through most of the region, a fair amount of clear skies. Minus 13 in the fort, minus 15 in Kenora, minus 14 in Dryden and Red Lake, also under mostly clear skies. Similar temperatures as you head into Sioux Lookout and Armstrong into Greenstone. They did have a uh, about six hours of some light snow this afternoon, but things have cleared out quite nicely. They're at minus 15, uh, Nipigon at minus 10, Marathon at minus 14, and Sault Ste. Marie is uh, mostly cloudy, and they are currently at minus 12, so very consistent temperatures across the board. Tonight, we are uh, looking at a chance of a little bit of uh, snow to start out and possibly overnight. We're going to drop down to minus 18, and wind chills could be as cold as minus 30 when you get up in the morning. 
However, when you get up in the morning, uh, although you might see a little bit of snow, we are going to see an improvement in temperatures as we slowly inch our way towards more seasonal daytime highs. I'm talking minus five, minus four. That's, that's the goal, so think warm thoughts. I'll have more details on how fast we'll get there later on in the news hour. Okay, thanks a lot, Fiona. Well, as we mentioned earlier in the newscast, today marks the one-year anniversary of the war in Ukraine. We'll have much more on that as your Friday news hour continues. On the longest day of our lives, the hardest day, we woke up early, he said, and haven't fallen asleep since.